Great. Hi, everyone. Like Robin said, my name is Alberto Ramos and I've uh, been at Plymouth State almost four weeks now, so I'm very new and just excited to have this conversation with you all. And I have the pleasure of introducing our presenter today. So I'm going to read a little bit about Kelsey and the Remedial Her Story Project, and then I'll turn things over to Kelsey. Again, this event is sponsored, co-sponsored with the CoLab um, and the Center for Diversity, Equity, and Social Justice. Robin, thank you so much for helping make this program happen. So we're excited that you all are here. So Kelsey Brooke Eckert, she, her, is an award-winning history teacher and the founder and president of the Remedial Her Story Project. She has taught high school social studies for the better part of a decade and, and is now the coordinator of social, just, social studies education at Plymouth State University. She was the 2020 Gilder Lerman New Hampshire Teacher of the Year and 2019 nominee, a 2016 Normandy Scholar, the 2015 New Hampshire National History Day Teacher of the Year, and serves as president of the New Hampshire Council for Social Studies. She earned a master's in social studies education and was the recipient of several academic awards, including Graduate Assistant of the Year and later Outstanding Graduate Alumni Award. And so uh, the Remedial Her Story Project is a New Hampshire-based nonprofit that was founded and led by Kelsey and other women educators and advocates. The Remedial Her Story Project is dedicated to developing and providing inquiry-based learning materials on women's history free to educators. In support of its mission, the Remedial Her Story Project produces media and provides resources and professional development in history for educators. Come get background on the Remedial Her Story Project from Kelsey, including details on the types of resources they offer and how you could use them with students. And so today we're gonna discuss more about the project and uh, the philosophical perspective on why including diverse women's achievements in our classes, regardless of subject is important. And uh, just so you all are aware, uh, Kelsey is going to present for about a half an hour, and then we're going to have time for questions at the end. So feel free to post them in the chat, or feel free to unmute yourself after the presentation, and we'll have um, more discussion. So with that, I'm going to pass things over to Kelsey. Yay, thank you, Alberto. <laughs> Um, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much. And it, this is funny. I, I, I often start by saying I think it's funny that I talk about women's history so much because unlike Robin, I have never taken a women's history class um, or a women's studies class. Um, and I'm, there are people on here who I know have and are superior to me in every way. Um, but I uh, got into learning about women's history partly because I realized that I didn't know it at all. And I was a certified social studies teacher in the state of New Hampshire. And um, I told Robin a silly story before we started, but I was doing my student teaching over at Interlakes uh, a decade ago. And the teacher showed a film that some of you might know, Iron Jawed Angels, um, that came out in the early 2000s about the suffragists and Alice Paul and Lucy Burns are sort of the main characters. And those two women, among others, are really responsible for women getting the right to vote in the United States. And I, not only had I never seen the movie, I'd never heard of those two women. And here I am, you know, on the precipice of being a certified social studies teacher. And I went, what? How did I get to this place? How did I, how am I here? What went wrong that I could have taken so many history classes and yet never have heard these women's names at all? Um, and so my, my interest um, and my research really started then and it ballooned to a book and a dissertation proposal and, um, you know, eventually this project, uh, because I was so confused as to how I got to where I am um, doing the work that I do. And I only really know what I call half of history. Um, and I think um, it's so <laughs> uh, this December, um, I presented a TED talk with my um, co-founder, Brooke Sullivan. Brooke is a PSU alumni. She went through our English ed program here um, and does not work in education at all now. She's in HR um, and is, is a queen boss lady in corporate America. But um, we did a TED Talk in December and you can find the TED Talk on our website, which I just threw up in the chat. And feel free to poke around on the website uh, while I present here because there's so much on there. Um, 
the TED Talk is in its editing stage. So I didn't know this, but they edit TED Talks. Who would have thought? I thought people were just brilliant um, and just could go for 18 minutes and, and do that. But um, it's so if you go to the site, it, it's the raw full event. So it's it's several hours of um, film and you can find us. I put the timestamp where we come in um, at the top. Um, so if you scroll down a little bit on our page, you can find it there. Um, and that could be viewing for later. But some of the things that we talk about in there, I'll talk about today. Um, and we can go from there. So our talk, um, I have presented about the Remedial History Project at um, the TED Talk. I've also, I was the keynote speaker for the National Women's History Museum um, last summer. Um, I presented this talk at the New Hampshire Council for Social Studies, the Massachusetts Council for Social Studies. So it's seen various forms, but Generally, our message is that in history, um, women's history should be half of what we're talking about because women are half the population. Um, Brooke and I both grew up in, Brooke is my co-host on our podcast that we have, um, and she's one of our co-founders and our treasurer. Um, she is uh, amazing and we both grew up playing sports and doing all these things and feeling very empowered but wondering you know when we look at the world that we're in today um, we see a lot of social issues that impact women in particular um, women make up only seven percent of fortune 500 companies six percent of Nobel prize winners 24 percent of people that are heard read about or seen in newspaper television and radio um, and to me, that's pretty alarming, just the fact that they're not even um, not even seen on, on television, you know, only 24%. So that's not half of the humanity. Um, women percent uh, reported only 37% of news stories. Um, this is true in democrat democracies as well. Um, in film, women are only 31% of speaking characters. 23% of protagonists in film are women, only 23%, that's less than a quarter of the main characters are, are women. So we don't see their story or perspective. 21% um, are filmmakers. Um, so part of the reason we're not seeing their stories is because they're not making the films. Um, in sport, uh, women are paid far less than men in wages and prize money globally. And this, if you pay attention to it, is being highlighted a lot. Um, there's a great social media account on her turf um, that I love. And they are constantly posting about women in sport and some of the big breakthroughs. The women's soccer team just this year settled a huge lawsuit um, with you know, the National Soccer Association. Um, when we get into like government, 24.9% uh, of parliamentarians in the world are women and only 23 women held positions as head of state and government last year. Uh, in the 2018 midterm elections, people were really excited because so many women were elected to um, our government, and that, which was great and it was very cool. And they now make up 20% of Congress. Yay, that's <laughs> not even close to half. Um, and only six out of our 50 governors in that same year were women. So it's pretty, uh, the, the data is just pretty alarming. And so we look at all of these things and as an educator, I am constantly coming back to, well, what are we doing to educate people to show that women not only can be, but have been in these roles forever and ever. And the thing that I harp on a lot, the more I've studied history, um, the more I realize that women have always been in those positions where they're just either erased or forgotten. Our first season of the podcast was really looking at why we have all these misperceptions about women. And so we have the first half of the episode is talking about the barrier. And then the second half of the episode is some sort of historic example of that not being true. Um, one interesting misperceptions we just ended talking about government and parliamentarians um, is that democracy actually held women back from holding leadership positions in government. Um, under monarchies, 
women had a path to power. Um, you can I can name million, hundreds of queens from history across the globe, um, from Queen Elizabeth to Catherine the Great to, you know, um, uh, Bing, Xi in China, you know, there, there's it across the board. And, um, and even, even in Muslim countries, women had paths to power. Um, and so it's hard because when democracy comes in, th that creates this, this barrier. And so um, there's so many really cool things about our world history that are lost when we exclude women. And, you know, the way that democracy was actually sometimes challenging <laughs> for, for women. Um, and, and it took, you know, centuries to fight for the vote and for leadership roles is just fascinating. So Brooke and I um, were really sick of lamenting that women weren't in history. We were sick of hearing the sentence, oh, I've never heard of her. It's like, you've never heard of Susan B. Anthony? Oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> like, like she's one of the most important women in American history and you've never heard of her. So we decided to do something about it. And the Remedial History Project came from sort of this combination of wanting to do something to address inequity um, and also to um, really think about how we can change change the narrative and stop lamenting the lack the lack of women because that's just not the type of people we are. We don't want to complain about it. We want to do something. So the Remedial History Project is this nonprofit. We have a board of directors from all over the world. We have um, members from Wales, Scotland, uh, California. We have contributors from Mexico and um, Germany and all over the place uh, supporting our work. The bulk of our board members are, are here in New Hampshire. Um, and our goal is to serve K to 12 education in particular, because at the college level, most college campuses have um, women's history programs, women's studies program. We have a minor on our campus, right? Those sort of things exist. But at the high, middle high school level, um, where the issues start to form, where the, the eraser really happens, there hasn't been this sort of trickle down effect. And middle high school students are, are left with these huge misperceptions when they get to the college level. And college professors of women's history and women's studies are constantly lamenting like, how do you not know these people? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it feels more like remedial history than uh, actual, you know, getting to get into the complex higher level thinking that should be happening on college campuses. And so the name for our organization um, on our homepage of our website, I, I share the um, a bit of the quote, but um, Gloria Steinem in one of her essays that she wrote, talked about how women's studies and African studies and indigenous studies on campus really are just remedial studies because they weren't taught to you in your primary and secondary educations and should have been. And so we sort of stole Gloria Steinem's language there and built our, our organization. Um, it is not, I've had a few people ask like, you know, remedial, like, is this, you know, some sort of like special ed thing? <laughs> no, 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 this is not what that is at all. Um, and certainly our tools are geared to be diverse to all learners, but, um, but that's not the aim. The aim is to really point out that this should be something everyone should know coming out of public schools. Um, this is us at our TED Talk uh, in December. Um, it was a women's event. So if you listen to the full TED Talk, there were lots of amazing talks um, from others about women. Um, there was a really good one that followed us about women in STEM. And the woman who gave that was amazing. She was a Air Force pilot and um, a, you know all sorts of amazing background experience. Um, and she shared a lot of data about women in, in STEM um, that, that was really impactful, uh, but lots of really amazing stories. So our perspective is that in every era, in every region of the world, um, we can tell women's history. And if, and if we don't, we're, we're neglecting half the story of the human race. Um, and it feels like this is incredibly true because we hear it all the time from people who are saying, I've never heard of this, I've never heard of that. And you've missed, you've missed half of it. And I think a lot of women and men, when they, when they come to uh, you know, learn about women's history, they 
are shocked that they didn't look at it from that angle or that perspective. And sometimes it's the stories like at the bottom here, there's a picture of Adam and Eve. Sometimes it's the stories we know, um, but you know, that the version of Adam and Eve that we've read in the Bible is the version recorded by men and passed down by men through, through history. And um, there are uh, other scrolls that have been uncovered uh, that look at Eve as this hero who's opening Adam's eyes. And it's a totally different analysis of the same, of the same story. And so there are a lot of really um, interesting ways that uh, we can, we can, you know, we can flip that narrative. And those scrolls that I just mentioned, Robin, I see your comment in the chat, are, were buried. They were, they were hidden in, in history and weren't uncovered until the 20th century. And so, um, you know, there, there are millions of examples of, of stories like that, where literally the story was, was forced out and, and buried because it was contrary to the narrative that people wanted to tell. So some of you might be familiar with the Bechtel test. Uh, the Bechtel test is uh, some, it came out in the 1980s by a woman named Alison Bechtel. And she in particular was frustrated with the lack of women in film. And I already rattled off some data about, about women in film, um, but it's pretty abysmal. And the way that women are portrayed in film, not just you know, being seen and heard on camera, um, but also the, the lens of the women's roles. One of my favorite films um, to show in my history classes is Argo, which is about the um, hostage crisis in Iran. And uh, this film totally bombs the Bechtel test. Um, the test is basically that there have to be two women in the film who at some point talk to one another. And um, they have to talk about something other than the male characters in the film. And um, so, so sort of three bars there, two women who exist, who talk to each other about stuff, like basically they have lives. And um, in the film Argo, the main woman in the film, she's the wife of one of the characters who's, in, who's hiding out um, and her big moment for on screen is she comes in and she goes, honey, are you coming to bed? You know, like, that's her line and she gets to leave. So like, does she have a line? Yes, but she's only talking to the male characters and it's only about them and what they're up to. Um, you know, and I can't, I, I mean, have you met women? Like, I can't imagine women in a hostage situation wouldn't be like planning the whole thing, you know, <laughs> so planning the way out um, and, and thinking about it themselves rather than leaving it to their spouses to figure out alone. So the Bechtel test is really interesting. And I started thinking years ago about my history classes and attempting to diversify what I was doing in the class. And I realized that I was essentially bringing women in to have their one line and then sending them away again. And if you look at history textbooks, women are often just sort of these like pop-up voices in the narrative, um, they might even like be a sidebar, like the, you know, the whole, the, the, the history textbook is going through, you know, the bigger period and um, larger events of the time. And it's like, oh yeah, this woman existed and her picture's on the side with a little blurb underneath her. And um, there's a lot of research by women's historians that talk about how pop-up history is really dangerous to, um, a dangerous way to teach women's history because it gives us the sense that women are separate from the larger story when women sometimes are right alongside their spouses, fathers, whatever in the, in the main story and they're contributing to it and they're part of it. Um, and other times it's leaving out this opportunity for a wider gendered analysis of whatever the history is that you're talking about, whatever the story is, whatever the cultural understanding is. And so the Bechtel test is sort of mocking pop-up history um, in, in the way that it works in film. And we are really conscious that we want to have um, we want to have more integrated history rather than just sort of like, oh yeah, she existed. Um, because oh yeah, she existed doesn't really tell students where women belong in the larger story and how they were a part of or dissimilar and in, in contrast, it doesn't validate the contrast to the, the, the mainstream story that we might be telling. So 
a lot of the research that I've done, um, this was largely in prep for my dissertation that I haven't done, um, but a lot of the research I've done is looking at um, the ways that history education in particular is dominated by men, um, not just in the stories that we tell, but literally they're the ones who teach our history. Um, social studies educators across the state, 58% of them, across the country, sorry, 58% of them are male. Um, it, the, the situation gets worse when you bring in race, 85% of them are white. Um, at the college level, it's worse than at the, on the lower levels. 65% um, of history PhDs are men. Um, and when you look at college campuses, and this is not true of our campus, thank goodness, but when you look at college campuses across the board, um, tenure track faculty tend to be, in the history departments, tend to be pretty dominated by white males. And um, at, when you look at lots of women tend to be college professors, but they're in positions like myself where they're teaching faculty or they are teaching lecturers or something like that. And so, um, and so it just sort of changes the legitimacy. There's actually a whole website, which some of you might be familiar with, um, which is Women Also Know Stuff. And um, there's one for history as well. I forget what it is, but um, if you're if you're hosting a panel or a talk and um, you want to have you know a woman be on that panel as an expert, um, women are often under asked to be um, experts on different topics, even though they like wrote their PhD on that or whatever. Um, and so it's kind of interesting. You, the, they've created an entire website to show like women actually know history and you can bring them. Thank you, for, Robin, for throwing that in the chat. Um, you can actually, you know, find women who are experts on the same topics that you would have brought males in to be on a panel for. Um, but this data is, is kind of problematic and I'll share sort of anecdotally. I, in my undergrad, I took many history classes um, and all of my history professors were male and they, all white. And that's not inherently problematic, um, except that they're not uh, doing, they're not teaching women's history and they're not integrating it into, into the curriculum. And I took a class on the American Revolution that I think is a, is a good sort of case in point. Um, the professor assigned four books that we were supposed to read on figures that he had deemed were prominent and important in the revolutionary period. And I don't think anyone in this group would contest that these people weren't important to the revolutionary period. They were uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, and John Adams. Um, of course, those people were important to the revolutionary period in American history. But the problem was that, first of all, we weren't invited to understand how he came to those conclusions. Um, for, and also all four of them represent a very similar class of Americans at that time. And how different would it that, how different would our understanding, our deep and rich understanding of America, the, Amer the revolutionary period have been if we had been taught about, you know, how this revolution impacted enslaved people. And it also would have changed the way I saw the Civil War because strategies that the British were using to recruit African Americans to their side um, were really similar to what the North used in the Civil War. <laughs> um, and, and there's a lot of parallels in history. Uh, and certainly we weren't, you know, we weren't asked to look at how revolutionary this period was for those diverse groups of people. Um, it's really hard looking at that now because I know so many women from that period now that have done lots of research for years. And to me, it's mind boggling that he excluded some of these women from, from the story because they were so important to, to the larger story. When I think about that class as, as how it impacted me as a student, I was happy to read about these men because they're all interesting and incredible. Um, but what I remember about these books, and they were really thick, you know, biographies, David McCullough style books. Um, what I remember about them was the ways in which women intersected their lives. So I remember thinking, you know, and I took these, this class years ago, decades ago, but I remember that 
Thomas Jefferson had children with Sally Hemings, one of his enslaved women on the plantation. Um, and I remember that Abigail Adams wrote John letters. And I remember that Ben Franklin was not really nice to his wife and child and kind of abandoned them and went to France. And what that should tell all of us now looking at it as teachers is that that's what our students are doing. They're looking for examples of people like them in the stories. And those examples that I just shared were all sort of footnotes to the larger stories that these men were having, um, men were experiencing. Um, someone just put in the chat, when I look, when I took my fifth graders to Boston every year to walk part of the Freedom Trail, I always hired Abigail Adams as our tour guide. I love that. Um, and we would also went and learned about Phyllis Wheatley, um, which is also really important. I love that. Yeah, I think it helps because students need to know that women were a part of it. They were part of the opposition. They were a part of, you know, they were loyalists and um, they were very much in, in patriots and in favor of, of the revolution and they shouldn't be excluded from that. And the, wh the why they did those things I think is really important. So it's not that men can't teach women's history, they certainly can. And some of the best people um, sometimes to do that are men. They just need to know that it's important to do it. Um, on our podcast, I've interviewed a guy, he calls himself the first ladies man um, because he's an expert in the first ladies. And I love that. He has a whole series on the first ladies. Um, but he loves to tell the story about how children love to see him in particular, this big six foot guy talking about women Women, you know, and that, that his expertise is about women in particular and, and valuing the work that they've contributed to our to our history. This, I think, helps make the point. This is um, male historians who write about women, 6%. So when we look at recent biographies, only 6% of male historians are writing about women. So if the majority of historians are men and only 6% of those men are writing about women. We've got an issue. Um, I used to, although this is less true uh, in recent years after George Floyd's death, but I used to go into um, bookstores and just look at, for books that are written, history books in particular, that are written about women, biography, or written, written about women, and nine times out of 10, they were written by other women, right, women historians. And so um, it's, it's tough because it, it really is leaving women the responsibility of telling the history of, of their gender. And um, that's, that's, I think, a little unfair um, because, because men are also responsible for the other half of the story. Kelsey, can you help me get my tweet right? Because that's crazy, <laughs> but go back to that slide because is it six, like, is it 6% of the, historical texts about women are written by men or is it that six percent of male historians write about women either one is bad six <laughs> percent of recent biographer biographies by men are about women gotcha okay yeah and there's um slate did a whole thing on this and there's a lot of data from the Book, uh, Brookings Institute that I'm citing here. So those are the two sources for these. And I'd be happy to share my bibliography with everyone too, if you wanna look at these sources. Um, so this is where it gets really tricky too. So if we look at how many people, you know, how many PhDs um, are, are women and the fact that men who, who dominate mostly in the teaching field are not really writing about women and probably also not teaching about women, um, there was a dissertation done in uh, Florida where she looked at Orange County um, public schools and surveyed all of the teachers within that school district um, about, you know, their teaching of women's history. She found that between five and 20 percent, with five percent being the plurality, so not the majority, but the plurality, um, between five and 20 percent of the teachers were actually teaching women's history. So this is like once a week or less women are being mentioned in class. And when I compare that with da similar data about, you know, black history or indigenous history, it's just not the same. Like this is a huge, huge 
issue in our public school system that nobody's really talking about. Um, and even when you look at like black history or indigenous history, it's often with the exception of like Pocahontas, it's often male figures within that um, diverse subset of American history or world history that are getting talked about and not the women that were right alongside with them. Um, and so this, you know, this is a this is a really big issue in public schools that that needs to be or yeah Cleopatra is a good example as well thank you yeah she's a good she's a good um, ancient history example the tricky thing though is that there are so many women in her time that could be mentioned um, and and aren't <laughs> you know Cleopatra sort of it's like oh we mentioned our one woman and so we'll move on but you know what about Zenobia what about Boudicca what about all these women who are literally going to war with the empire and aren't aren't mentioned at all yeah seven other pharaohs yep perfect <laughs> so um I created a test <laughs> called the Eckert test and the Eckert test is basically just copying the Bechtel test <laughs> for history lessons in public schools. And this is what the Remedial History Project really tries to push for people. Um, we try to make it so that two women exist in a history lesson. Those two women have different opinions about the topic. Um, and those, those women come from different backgrounds on it so that you can show that you know, I think one of the other really big dangerous things that happens with pop-up history is that that one woman that pops in starts to represent all women. And we know that that's not really true, that no one woman represents all women. Um, and we need to let women be diverse and disagree with one another. Um, I often think that, you know, women's fights get categorized and belittled as like cat fights. I think mostly because we don't have enough examples of women disagreeing in the past over legitimate things. Um, when we allow only one woman to pop in, often that one woman is white because she had greater access. And so when we have only one white woman representing all women, it really doesn't get to the many layers of class and race and um, all the ways in which those things intersect in women's lives. And so this is a, is a small step, similar to the Bechtel test, in attempting to correct that. Um, it's really hard to do. And uh, when I started trying to diversify the lessons that I was teaching in the high school, um, I just took lessons that I had and started inserting women. And so just to give you a sense of the way that women sometimes get put in a position of speaking for all women, um, I had a lesson on the founding of the NAACP, which was really about Booker T. Washington, um, who founded the Tuskegee Institute, if you're not familiar, and um, W.E.B. Du Bois, who did the Niagara Movement. Um, he was the first Black graduate of Harvard. Um, and they're both incredible. Um, but right alongside them and also a founder was this woman, Ida B. Wells Barnett. And she's incredible. And so I was like, oh, well, I'll just put her with these, th these guys. And the three of them can look at they had really different perspectives on how to advocate for Black people in the turn of the century time period. And her perspective was even more radical than both of theirs. And so why not throw her into the mix? But like I said, Ida B. Wells is really radical. She didn't really represent all women, or certainly not all Black women. And so um, throwing her in there makes it seem like all Black women were infinitely more radical than the men at the time. And that's just not true. Um, and so it, it, it messes up how what students start to perceive about women um, because they're not seeing the diversity of women's voices. And I wish if I could go back, I would have found a, a fourth person, you know, a different woman who maybe had um, less access than Ida Wells had. She was educated, she was a journalist, um, and maybe there was a woman who was poorer and more intimidated. Ida B. Wells was bold, you know, maybe there was this other woman out there who could share a different way of looking at what people needed to be doing in that, in that time period. So 
all of this gets to this idea that women are really um, dynamic and we want to make sure that we're letting women be visibly dynamic in our history classes. And I'll just walk you through a, a really quick story. Um, in early American history, uh, the, the biggest war, the bloodiest war in American history is the war between the Puritans and the Wampanoag Native Americans here in New England. Um, it's the bloodiest war as a percentage of the population. And Witamu is a uh, chief of one of, of the within the Wampanoag Confederacy that is um, fighting against um, and, and trying to deal with the encroachment of the English as they're coming into her land. She marries multiple times in her life. They're all really like political marriages. Um, when war finally breaks out between the indigenous population and the Puritans and some of the Native Americans that stayed, you know, stayed on that on their side in the war, um, she actually breaks up her marriage in order to join her sister and her sister's husband, King Philip um, or Metacomet, um, to fight against the English settlers. And um, so she literally like ends a marriage in order to, to do this. Through her various marriages she had had over her lifetime, she had actually unified the whole Confederacy behind her. And so whatever side she ended up on meant that that side was gonna have most of the Wampanoag with her. And um, so she is so fascinating. Um, she's a, a chief, she's a leader. Uh, the Wampanoag were matrilineal. And so, um, you know, wealth and inheritance descended through female lines. And um, I have the, the war, what's complicated about it is this war goes down in history as King Philip's war. Um, and it's not her war. And she's the one who basically put the weight of the Wampanoag behind King Philip. Um, and so she's interesting. Um, we could bring in a white woman here. Mary Rowlandson was captured by the Wampanoag during this conflict um, and was Widamu's prisoner during the war. And she actually wrote a book about it, which is the picture of the cover is here. Um, and so you can read her source as a primary source. This is like early, the earliest American history that you can get. And we have a woman writer, author writing about it. And I think that's so cool because sometimes people say, oh, well, we just don't know about it because we don't have sources. And it's just, that's just not accurate. And every period, anytime you can find sources either about or by women. Um, and men have loved women forever. They've written about women, <laughs> right? It, it, the, those sources are there. Um, you just have to look for them. And so Mary Rowlandson's interesting. She complained about Widamu. She said that she starved her and all these things. Um, and, you know, Widamu was in charge of a massive war effort in a time of scarcity um, with, you know, still dealing with disease and plague and all of these other things. And so it's, they're just really fascinating women to sort of like put against each other in perspective. Um, and what's interesting before I get to Mercy Otis Warren, she, uh, gets ransom, Mary Rowlandson gets ransomed home to her people, um, whereas Widamu actually uh, dies in the conflict. She was trying to flee the, um, some battle that was going on, and she crossed a river and drowned, and the English uh, grabbed her and decapitated her and brought her head back um, to the village, and when the Wampanoag saw her head on this pike, they were wailing in agony because their leader had died. And so just to like put emphasis on the fact that, you know, women, even when they are leaders, even when they are the top of the, the pyramid in a society, often get overlooked when that history gets written. And, you know, again, the war was named after the man and Widamu, you know, it was her head that they were wailing over, not his. Um, that one's tricky though, because you're also bringing in an issue of race. And so maybe it's because she was indigenous and it's not part of the, you know, the positive narrative of American history or something like that. And maybe that's why she got overlooked. Um, so then I love to bring in Mercy Otis Warren. Mercy Otis Warren was a prominent writer in the American Revolution. She wrote may, arguably more than people like 
Thomas Paine, who we've all heard of. She wrote play after play, poem after poem. Um, and she wrote under a pseudonym, which sometimes could lead to her um, eraser in history. She was friends with the Adams family. Um, she was friends with the Jeffersons. She wrote the first history of the United States, um, but nobody's read it because apparently that's not important. Um, she, uh, her book was really widely read in its time um, and then got erased over time. Uh, Thomas Jefferson bought copies of her history for his cabinet, uh, largely because she was very critical of her friend, John Adams, who she believed was a monarchist. Um, when the Constitution was being floated around, she wrote an anti-federalist critique of the Constitution. Um, she was very opposed to the way our government is structured. Um, and I think this just kind of sums it up when um, John Adams tried to get her to take out, take back what she had said about him in his in her book, um, and she didn't back down. And so he said, you know, publicly uh, that perhaps history is not the province of the ladies. And so uh, that was the only way that he could sort of make his make his point to get rid of her. But I think um, we could do this for any time. You know, we can do this on D-Day. I uh, studied D-Day. I was a Normandy scholar uh, for a year, um, got to travel over to the beaches of France to study this really important event in our history. Um, no women were allowed to be on the beaches of D-Day um, that, that morning because it was so dangerous. And this was definitely not a place for a lady to be. Um, but some of the best witnesses to D-Day were French women who were living on the coasts. Um, there's this woman, uh, Marie-Louise Azamat, who kept a diary throughout the entire invasion. Um, she actually kept a diary prior to the invasion. And so we know about a lot about how people were treated. Um, French people were treated under Nazi occupation um, from her. Uh, we know a lot about that day and how the invasion went. Um, the poor woman had to go out and like feed her cows while there are bombs going off all around her. Like just pretty wild to think about the real lives of people living in France. Um, there was also an American journalist. She was um, Martha Gellhorn uh, was told that she wasn't allowed to go because she was a woman. And she's like, well, wait a second, you're giving press passes to all the men. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, they're not armed. They're not ready to fight. Like, I'm right there with them. She, uh, interestingly, she was uh, Ernest Hemingway's girlfriend at the time. And um, so she stowed away on a ship and uh, helped carry a stretcher at, on the beaches um, that morning and then wrote a really vivid, widely read account of D-Day um, that actually was more popular than Hemingway's account in its time. So, you know, there's think, there's stories like that and you can do it even when women are intentionally excluded from the history. Um, you know, even D-Day, you can tell from a woman's perspective. Eleanor Roosevelt was the person who addressed the nation that morning um, to let, you know, to calm people down and say it's happening and we're gonna be okay. And the best thing that we can do is X, Y, and Z. Um, so, you know, we can, we can get women into the into the history. Um, the formula is really rigged to exclude women um, in, in a number of ways. The way we define history by having it be about politics and um, economics, you know, big businessmen and things like that. Those, you know, imagine how different history classes would be if it was if this the focus of history was less on economics and politics and um, and, and diplomacy and, and things that women have been excluded from in a lot of history. Imagine how different history could be if it was focusing on child rearing, right? And like different methods of child rearing through time, right? Like that's a different theme and it has changed and there's an interesting history there. Um, if we brought in religious history, women have been a part of religious history from its origins and every single world religion some of the first converts were women, right? In Judaism, it was Sarah. In uh, Islam, it was Khadija. Um, in Christianity, it was Mary and Mary and all the other Marys, right? So like there, there's so many examples of women through religious history that it would totally change if that was the emphasis. Um, medical history, right? People have been trying to figure out how to save women from dying in childbirth for all of time. Right. And so if we talked about medical history more um, in, in our history classes, we would have more representation of women. But I think the reality is because it's not being taught 
to us, we don't know it. And, you know, as much as I was embarrassed that I didn't know who Lucy Burns and Alice Paul were during my student teaching, the reality is like, I can't blame myself. Like I wasn't taught this stuff. No one, no one seemed to think that that wasn't how I got the right to vote was not an important part of my history education um, and the ways in which it was done, the methods that the, the protesters used, um, the strategies that they used. Um, the second part of the problem is that when we do teach women's history, it's, you know, we're not letting it be diverse. And so what remedial history is trying to do is, is make it diverse, right? Show that women are complicated and they disagree and um, they, they have, you know, internal arguments and it's, it, you know, every issue that impacts women is, is compounded or made more complex when you add in race and class and, and other things. Um, we also have this issue in our country and especially in our state right now where social studies education broadly is under attack. Um, on Wednesday, I'm gonna be on NPR, which is kind of crazy, but I'm talking about this attack um, uh, in a, on a panel um, that happened a couple weeks ago down in Franklin. Um, we have, there's a million ways in which it's under attack, but I mean, the biggest are the lack of emphasis put on it. It's sort of like the ugly stepchild of the four core subjects. Um, and, you know, simultaneously people are complaining about how students don't know their history. They don't know, they don't know their rights. Their civic understanding is flawed. And all of that is true. And yet we find ways to systematically attack the social studies. There have been, I am the president of the New Hampshire Council for Social Studies and every week I get a legislative update and I am like so overwhelmed by how many bills I'm supposed to be standing against right now um, under attack in our legislature. Um, the, you know, and that's just, that's at the, the state level in the classrooms, in, in individual schools, they find ways to schedule elementary school social studies only on Mondays, which just happens to be the day that most federal holidays fall on. So whenever there's a federal holiday, no social studies that week. Um, you know, you're supposed to be having 45 minutes of social studies every single day. And in a lot of schools and a lot of elementary schools, it's happening maybe 45 minutes a week. Um, and it's, it's really horrifying. Um, I, you know, during the pandemic, uh, my, the high school that I used to teach at, or the, the school system that I used to teach at completely cut social studies from the elementary curriculum, preferring to emphasize math and English because math and English are the ones that are tested. And, you know, that's true, but I, so, so we're okay with kids not knowing. I mean, I, I would remediate things at the high school level that are so basic, fundamental, like mapping, you know, here's where the prime meridian is. Like, it was just, it was unbelievable the things that I had to teach to high school students that they should have mastered by the time they got to, to me. Um, and I, I really, I can't emphasize enough the lack of social studies skills that, that students come into the upper grades with. And then, you know, here in our department, we, we talk about, you know, the, the lack of things they've gotten out of high school. Um, and it's, it's just, it's a compounding effect over 12 years of, of public education. So, you know, as much as the issue is about women's history, frankly, we just need to advocate for the social studies in general, right? Um, and, and to really respect the professionalism of education educators. Um, we at Remedial History host a summer educators retreat, and we definitely had a few people say, I would love to come, but I'm not sure that diversity and inclusion is something that I can get refunded back by my school right now um, because of the political climate. So one thing that we, you know, our motto is just sort of be brave. Like you might not entirely know all of the things about women's history that you need to know, but we really need to be brave. We need to basically, whenever we think we know a history, we need to question the history that we think we know. And if the history that you think you know doesn't include women, like you're probably wrong because they were there. Um, even things like you know, even in the STEM field, I'm, I'm mind blown how many times in the STEM fields I learned that behind the man who got credit for X discovery, there was a woman right there with him. Um, you know, Pythagoras, for example, said horrible things about women and their intellect, but Pythagoras's math teacher was a woman, um, which just makes me laugh. Um, 
you know, Albert Einstein got credit, credit for the theory of relativity, but he co-wrote that theory with his wife who didn't get credit. Um, and one of my favorite Einstein quotes that I hope you all share is he said, I love my wife. She does all my math for me. Um, children in schools need to see women and they need to see them in lots of different jobs. Um, he was married, he, they did get divorced. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, children need to see women in lots of different roles in order to believe that they can do those roles. I personally think history education is really just supporting, you know, the STEM initiatives and the art initiatives and the, you know, the goal to get more women elected into positions by showing that women have been in those roles. Um, you know, people like Shirley Chisholm come to mind. I mean, how many people learned about Shirley Chisholm and her run for president um, as Kamala Harris is, is doing her work? And um, how, how interesting, how different would it be if Shirley Chisholm's achievement of just being a woman on the ballot period, um, it, you know, in her time um, was something, was more common knowledge for, for our students. Um, I also think that part of why I talk about remedial history and part of the work that we're doing is just to advocate for people to be aware of how like how big the issue is we're talking about five percent of current curriculum five to twenty with five being the plurality is as about women and that's a serious serious issue um and so you know women's history professors are have been alarmed about it as their children come home with you know the homework that they're doing um but I think more people need to be aware about how big how big the problem is so um, I will show you just really quickly on our site. We have a lot of different things um, available to, to resources for people to help you. Um, We have a lot of different resources on our website that are, I think are really helpful to people in trying to address this problem. So um, this is, this is our, our website. Um, we have our podcast, actually, this is our host site, but you can find it on Apple, on Spotify. It comes out every Monday. Um, it, we have, so we have a, usually a history professor somewhere in the world. This week's actually happens to be about um, from a PSU, former PSU professor, Marsha Blaine, um, Marsha Schmidt Blaine, we interviewed her about um, women in the White Mountains. And so this is a really New Hampshire specific topic this week. Um, but we try to have it be really diverse with like world history, US history, hit on lots of different regions of the world. Um, and that's just to sort of remediate the intellectual knowledge that people have. Um, you can learn more about our board, about us. Um, we have lesson plans on our site. Um, there are, for every era of US history um, and for every period of world history, we've tried to build a lesson plan that uses the inquiry model, which is sort of current practice in social studies ed, where it gives you like diverse sources from women. Um, we have a few students on campus that are helping to build our PowerPoints. So there's, there's a PowerPoint for world history that'll be out by the end of this term that Gavin McWeeny, who's one of the SSE students on campus is helping me build. Um, this one is coming soon. I'm really excited about this. Um, just sort of making Queen Isabella share some of the blame that's cast at Columbus because <laughs> uh, she's the one funding him and putting the pressure uh, to bring back gold and all the stuff that led him to do what he did. Um, she also knew about the genocides and didn't do anything to stop it. Um, so I think that's important context. Um, so anyway, there's there's lessons for for every era. So this is just you know early U.S. history, um, and you know you can see how many different different lessons that we have we have there. When we started our site, um, it was actually was just this stuff down here, and these are lesson plans that we. We basically curated the internet and found everything that we could find that was out there. And so um, from Gilder Lehrman to the New York Historic Society, the National Women's History Museum, the Stanford History Education Group, any lesson that any of those people had, we also put up here. So, um, so those are available to people, to educators. Um, 
We do have some things for younger grades. Uh, where is it? Sorry, I'm jumping around. Um, so elementary school lesson plans. Um, this summer, uh, August 8 to 10, we're gonna have an educators retreat at the Common Man here in Plymouth. Um, and it'll be our second annual. We did it uh, last year as well. So you can get the details about that. We have about 15 different scholars from around the country slash Mexico um, coming. We also have someone from Scotland who will be presenting virtually. Um, people can get professional development if they're you know, in a K to 12 school for listening to our podcast. And so the, the resources are there. Um, we're in the middle of producing a video series. A few of the communications majors on campus helped me film um, our scripts. So we, the first couple episodes are out um, on this. There's a little, this is a very short abbreviated version of this talk today. Um, but these are all the episodes that we hope to produce. And we have, um, we've done three so far. We have seven that are in production mode and then we'll keep going in the fall. Um, and this is essentially like a crash course video series on women's history for both US and world history. And um, we have teams of scholars from around the world helping us to produce that series. Um, Jackie Nelson, who's one of our teaching lecturers on campus, is one of the world on the world history team helping to write those, those um, scripts. And um, there's more about our podcast here. You can also, we also have like show notes for each of the episodes, which you can check out. Um, we have an on this date calendar that another SSE student is helping to produce on campus. It's basically on this day, here are things that happened in women's history, just sort of, you know, random trivia for your day. Um, we have books that we recommend, although this isn't up to date. Our social media is just flooded with books that we think are great and want people to read. We've tried to put these in um, order. So these are um, mostly written about women um, that we think would be great to use. Um, for literature people, we've included a lot of really strong historical fiction that's grounded in good history. Um, this is one of my favorites, The Invention of Wings. It's about um, Sarah and Angelina Grimke, who are real women from South Carolina. Um, and we also highlighted feature films that we think pass the Bechdel test. Um, so down here we've provided, it just takes a second to load, but we put the trailers to all of these movies. Um, and those, I think these are just awesome. So if you haven't seen some of these movies, maybe that could be your weekend learning. <laughs> Um, so anyway, there's there's tons of resources on our site, and that was a lot of details about remedial history. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions. I know we're getting close to noon, so. Kelsey, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I, that was really informative and like really helpful, and so I, I, I'm really excited to check out some of those resources that you shared. Um, we do have just about, a, excuse me, we do have just about a minute left, and so I think we could take maybe two questions feel free to post in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself um, if you'd like to ask a question. Jesse, thank you for your comment about theater. I would love to chat at some point about that. I have a question. Um, I, I didn't look, are, the, are your materials that you guys are making, do you openly license those? Um, are they like, do they have a CC license on them? Do you know? I'm not exactly sure what that means, but they're free to download and use and take. I'm so glad you don't know what that means because that means um, that we should have a meeting because I think there's a whole wing of people who make OER, open educational resources, who like, I don't think necessarily are super familiar with this project yet. And they're going to go crazy when they see this like <laughs> the, the content that you guys have developed like there's so much I don't understand if you don't sleep or like how you do it but but anyway um I'll make a meeting at some point when you have time um to talk about some licensing that might help you um get these into the hands of educators even more easily so it's okay. incredible stuff Kelsey, Any other questions? Go ahead. Oh, um, this is really great. So I am the new director of the Museum of the White Mountains um, and have 
lots of things I feel like we should talk about. But the one thing I wanted to share, and I'll just put it in the chat. I don't know, you may already be familiar with this, um, but it's uh, it's it's similar to, to sort of what you're working on, but specifically about um, the history of art. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and it's a, it's, um, it's actually the woman who is the editor of my book, who is also the editor of Sarah Jane Steen's book that just came out. Um, this is her project. So her name's Erica Gaffney, um, and she is an editor for Amsterdam University Press and then does freelance work as well. And um, used to be at Ashgate. So she actually lives in Vermont, but um, works for a company in Amsterdam. But um, I think there's there's some interesting overlap. And, and if you weren't aware of it, I just wanted you to know it was there. Um, and then at some point it would be great to talk about possible collaborations with the museum and thinking about sort of object-based curricular materials. And, um, and obviously, you know, Marsha, so you know that there was an exhibition that, um, that was here in 2016. Yeah, I loved it. I brought all my students. <laughs> great, great. Um, so, so let's let's talk more another time for sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you for sharing that resource. We'll make sure it's up there. A large part of what we're doing is just curating. So when people send, you know, there's a lot of like, have you heard of this? Have you heard of that? And we're like, no, let's throw it up there, um, so that nobody has to reinvent the wheel. I think that's a, there's a lot of that in social studies ed teachers being like, oh, I got to build a lesson plan on this and why not make them widely available? They're pretty. <laughs> well, thank Does you everybody. Uh, I was going to offer if anybody else had one more question before we're done here. Well, I guess my question for you, Kelsey, is how, what can we do to support the project, uh, support you in your work? now that we've learned about it? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, we're always seeking new board members. Um, so we have a pretty big board, but we would love to have people involved in that way. Um, if anybody has a topic that they wanna come on the podcast to be interviewed about, we'd love to do that. So people can contribute their, their knowledge that way. Um, we, you know, we, we're looking for script writers for different episodes on the video series. Um, they're, you know, short, 2,500 word scripts. Um, and that, you know, if that sounds interesting, if you feel like you have an expertise to contribute or an era that you could certainly speak to, that would be amazing. Um, and then I think part of it is just getting things into the hands of educators. And so if you know a, you know, K to 12 teacher who needs help and <laughs> needs, you know, could use some diversifying, it's all free and it's all there. Great. Well, thank you so much. Again, thank you for presenting to us today and being here with us. Thank you all for joining. Robin, thank you again for helping to organize this program. And uh, this recording will be available. So please encourage others that weren't able to join us live to watch the recording. And uh, hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Alberto. Thanks.